So today we're going to have a look at the components of blood, kind of like we did in the last section where we looked at the structure and the function and how they related to each other. I want you to focus on that as we're going through this, as we talk about the different components. I want you to look at the function or look at the structure, kind of pay attention to what it looks like, and then compare that and see how that's related to uh, how it performs or what it does. Now there are four main components to the blood. Uh, there's a liquid component that makes up about half, a little more than half of your blood content, and then there's a solid component made up of a bunch of different cells. Now the main components are plasma, red blood cells, or we call them erythrocytes, white blood cells, we call leukocytes, or platelets, which we call thrombocytes. Now in science, tw sorry, science 30 curriculum, you don't need to know the big fancy science names. You don't need to know thrombocytes and, and erythrocytes, etc. I do put that in here because you may come across that on, say, some YouTube videos where they use those words, but that's, um, that's Bio 20 terminology. Now, if we look at the components here, you can see some different parts of the blood. You can see some red blood cells here. You can see some different types of white blood cells. These ones are colored in yellow. These ones are colored in blue. Okay, you can see sort of a background area that's kind of shaded a greenish sort of black color. That would be the plasma. And then one thing missing from here, I don't see any in here, would be platelets. Those would be just some little smaller cell fragments. Now starting with the biggest, the largest component, your plasma. As I said, it makes up about 55% of the blood volume. If you had a test tube and you filled that test tube with blood and you let the blood sort of settle for a period of time, kind of like orange juice. If you had some pulpy orange juice in a glass and you had that before you went to bed and you left that sitting next to your, next to your bed, by the time you woke up in the morning, it would be all sort of liquidy and clear on the top, like watery on the top, and all the solid parts would sink to the bottom. So very similar with your blood. About half of that volume of blood, a little more, would be the plasma component and then the bottom part would be all the cellular component. Now, the plasma serves a few functions. It contains all of the dissolved minerals and ions, all the food essentially that was absorbed by your digestive system is now floating around in the plasma of the blood. Um, Bio 30, you learn about hormones, so how the hormones get transported around the body through the circulatory system, okay, float in the plasma. Uh, other things like antibodies will float in the plasma. Uh, a whole assortment of things. You can kind of think about the plasma like water in a river. So, I mean, there's solid components that are in the water. There's, you know, little rocks and fish and insects and whatever. Those would be like your cells. But then the water itself contains a whole bunch of things. Everything from, uh, you know, different, different minerals that are in the soil. Uh, even stuff like caffeine we find in, in the North Saskatchewan. Uh, antidepressants are found in the North Saskatchewan because all these things, I mean, what, what goes down the, the sewage winds up getting into the North Saskatchewan. Most of it's filtered out, but the, the processing can't filter out the little tiny molecules like caffeine and antidepressants and other chemicals. Anyways, the plasma would be comparable to the water in a river and it dissolves or it has all the dissolved materials that the cells need inside of it. This is just a picture showing what plasma would look like if you separated the cellular component out from it. So kind of a yellowy sort of clear uh, uh, solution. And it's yellowy because of all the different minerals and chemicals, food and everything that's dissolved in it. Now for the cellular part, this is where we spend most of the time learning in Science 30. Red blood cells, like I said, called erythrocytes. If we were to look at a sample of blood, red blood cells would be the greatest component. Here's a typical slide showing a number of different cells. And what you can see here, all these little reddish sort of pink cells, those are all going to be your red blood cells. So if we look at a sample of blood, you can see that it's the most numerous. Now, if we look at them structurally, this is most of them you're seeing kind of from the top. They almost look like a little Cheerio. They've got sort of not really a hole in the middle. Like this looks like a Cheerio with a hole, but it's not hollow in the middle. It's sort of like a depression. It's like if you took a piece of dough and you pinched, like a little round piece of dough, and you pinched it in in the middle, it sort of is caved in, and that's kind of why you're seeing it sort of clear in the center. Those cells, we would call them biconcave, meaning that they're caved in on both ends of the cell. Now, the main role of these is that they transport oxygen. That's why they get their reddish colors, because they contain oxygen, and the oxygen reacts with some of the chemicals that are in the red blood cells, and that causes that chemical to turn red. We'll get to that in a second.
So here's another picture showing at them a little closer with an electron microscope. You can see it's pinched in in the middle. That would be the, the like the dough pinched in. This is from the side. So again, you can see it's sort of caved in a little bit in the middle there. Now, the molecule that I was talking about is called hemoglobin. And red blood cells, they don't have a nucleus produced in the bone marrow. They lose their nucleus as they develop so that they can kind of spare that space or they give up their nucleus in exchange for carrying extra hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a molecule, it's a protein mixed with iron that allows the red blood cells to carry all that extra oxygen. If a cell didn't have, a red blood cell didn't have hemoglobin on it, it wouldn't be able to carry as much oxygen. Okay, very simple. And that's why blood turns red when it mixes with oxygen. If you can think of your car, if a car has some rust on it, that's the iron in the car that's mixing with the uh, oxygen that's in the air, and you wind up getting that sort of reddish rust that starts forming. Just a picture showing the hemoglobin molecule. You can see it's got this crazy little zigzaggy shape. The important thing there is these iron atoms that are mixed in with the hemoglobin. Now, the second part of the of, sorry, of the blood is the white blood cells. And we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about these when we get into the next section on the immune response. White blood cells, their role is simply to involve fighting off uh, viruses and bacteria, different types of pathogens. If we come back to this slide, you can see in this slide, here's a couple different white blood cells. Notice they have some different names. In, again, in Science 30, you won't be responsible for these names. These are things you might have looked at in Bio 20. But you can see they're less numerous than all those red blood cells that are in here, a little bit larger than the red blood cells. And the key thing about them is they kind of, they're white blood cells, but they're stained kind of a purple color. And that's because they have a nucleus inside of them. So again, unlike the red blood cells, these guys contain, they keep their nucleus when they mature. And the good thing about that is then they're able to replicate all on their own. They don't need to constantly be generated from the bone marrow like red blood cells do because red blood cells don't have a nucleus. So they can't divide on their own. White blood cells are able to do that. This is a picture showing a type of white blood cell. This would be, we call it a killer T or a cytotoxic T cell. You can see how it's touched sort of the surface of what would be a cancer cell. This would be the cell membrane of a cancer cell. And almost like tissue paper, you can see how the cancer cell now has all these little tears in it. So it basically destroyed this cancer cell by coming into contact. The third component is platelets. And again, the major thing behind platelets or about platelets is that they're responsible for clotting the blood. Okay? They produce these little filaments, these little protein filaments that will block, they'll form over top of an injury and that will trap red blood cells so that the blood, the white blood cells, all the cellular, the blood components won't be able to leak out of the circulatory system. 